Hello. Okay, so I want to talk to you about a triumvirate of value. Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> well, first we have to start with defining value. Um, yeah, I'm a product manager, right? Uh, product designer in my background. Um, I'm an entrepreneur and what all those things have in common is an understanding and a deliberate intentional use of value propositions, right? So product in my world, uh, I like to say product is another word for value. So you've got product design is really value design. Product management is really value management. Product delivery is value delivery. Product discovery is value discovery. You can go on and on. It, it actually applies pretty well. Um, and it's something to get exciting about because it provides a bit of clarity around the natural tensions that we have in product management, uh, in product discovery, and in obviously product delivery as well. So when I say product at the core and adopting uh, good habits of, of practicing product at your core. What I mean is, uh, one, the more obvious, you know, always ask why. Um, a lot of folks, when they talk about product, people say that, you know, we're always asking why, we own the why, um, we represent the user, and therefore the why. And yes, that's absolutely true. Uh, it totally resonates with me as a product person, and I like to champion that. But, uh, you can add to that is, is really why does this add value? Uh, and so this brings us to our point of that, that triumvirate of value, right? Uh, adopting a product at your core is really injecting value proposition mindfulness at the core of all your efforts. So much like how you want a balance of mind, body, and spirit, you need a balance of technological feasibility, business viability, and of course, user need or usability. These three things are at natural odds with each other. Uh, it's a good tension, it's a good balance, it makes for better products. Um, and just to give you an example, maybe you've been on a team where you have a, uh, maybe a solutions architect or a tech lead who always seems to kind of halt progress because they have another what if, or what are you gonna do about this? And maybe folks start to argue a little bit. You start to hear the word tech debt or UX debt. Uh, and then no progress happens, right? In the end, people go home and they're upset. That tech lead or solutions architect is not being a jerk. They are pushing for and fighting for true value at the feasibility level. Now, it does not mean that they can't think about business needs or user needs, but that's their role. Their number one core competency is to fight for making sure that we maximize value, minimize the amount of effort for the most return at the feasibility level, right? And so then you have your product people, product designers, product managers, uh, who often ask why, maybe product designer is building the what or designing the what, but uh, product people at their core are asking why and they're representing the user's needs, right? Um, so this is, we'll, we'll stick with the why theme for right now. With that, what you see is you have product people, uh, product designers and product managers uh, who are pushing back for the user's need, right? Maybe they've been doing research and they have actual quotes or actual or data to support these, these, these pushbacks. Maybe it's a hunch. Maybe they themselves are a user. Maybe you're so early in the process that you're just trying to establish baseline to get to the point of researching, right? Um, there's a lot of unknowns there, and typically product people are very comfortable in the unknown and in the future. They're not necessarily as inhibited by the how or the feasibility of things. That's a natural tension as well, you're pushing back. But I wanna talk about a third one as well, right? So you can have the most useful product that meets user needs. You can have the most feasible product, it's scalable, it's uh, cost, sensitive and <laughs> easy for developers to dive in and get involved, right? Let's say it's perfect on the feasibility and the usability front. But if there aren't any business cases for this, if it's not desirable for, say, one of the big box shops to get involved, they have no need to get involved. If it doesn't hurt them or impact them or benefit them, they're never going to adopt it. 
And the same goes for new fledgling entrepreneurs, right? These exactations and adaptations of things. You, you, you launch a marketplace and suddenly a thousand people become entrepreneurs overnight because now they're pushing, they're selling their apps. Uh, they have the ability to sell their 3D models. Um, you know, maybe they, they make indie games and now there's a platform to be able to sell their indie games. They're motivated by that, right? The same has to be true about your efforts. It could be super useful and super feasible, but if it's not attractive for new entrepreneurs or new creators to get involved and support it, if you're lacking that business viability or solving for those business needs, it could be dead in the water, right? So it's about balance. Um, I think what we often experience in the metaverse space is a lot of business talk or stakeholders uh, talking about their business case. Maybe they're talking to their investors about owning the metaverse, but then talking to the public about making an open metaverse. Um, maybe that's a tension that they're facing. Um, but I think that we have a lot of business need and we have a lot of feasibility discussions, right? At this point, mostly devs are the ones who can get involved and really talk about this stuff. Um, not knocking the efforts of so many other people. There's amazing content people and strategists and marketers and researchers and user-centered people that are involved in the metaverse work. And I salute you and we're so thankful for you. Really, this is a call to arms for more of those people to get involved. If this discussion with Omi, um, I know it's something that we take very seriously, Angel representing the user. Um, if these discussions for the, for the open metaverse and to come together, if they're only about feasibility, if it's only developers in the room talking, right? We're leaving a lot, a whole lot out there on the table. We can make the most feasible thing and we can make the most business viable thing. But if it's not useful, if it doesn't put the user at the center, if it doesn't actually solve problems for them, again, it's never going to get used. So that's why, or at least that's what I mean <laughs> when I'm saying the metaverse is for everyone and everyone can add value to it. If you are just a super tidy person and you really like organizing your Notion folder, uh, we could use your help, right? Uh, if you run workshops, discovery workshops, or stakeholder workshops, or user persona workshops, we could use your help. Um, I mean, really, at the end of the day, the metaverse is bigger than us all. I don't know what I don't know, right? We can't foresee every single problem or roadblock we're going to go up against. But if you know somebody who's already tried to federate the metaverse, and I know there's a lot of you out there, uh, please get them involved too. We want to learn from past efforts. Um, so anyways, thank you for your time today. Um, you know, it, it, the triumvirate of value, <laughs> if you will, is something that I talk about a lot. Um, it's often really easy for me to get sidetracked or to lose people along the way. So I wanted to record a video just so that anybody who's, who's interested in this topic, or at least in understanding uh, a bit more about uh, what my rants mean, uh, hopefully this video helps you. Um, so yeah, uh, go ahead and follow AngelXR. It's Angel underscore XR on Twitter because somebody has the, the real username. Uh, and I'm at Mr. Metaverse. If you have any questions, if you want to get involved, please reach out. Thanks.